bruh, I can't believe more people aren't raving about this series. It's so gripping. It leaves me at the literal edge of my seat and even has the audacity to kick me off of it entirely. Welcome to Day Day Does, a channel where you basically watch me draw and talk about fandom slash storytelling things. So I'm still working on that diversity video I mentioned previously. In order to give it more time so it can be a thoughtful and interesting topic, I'm going to make this comic recommendation video first. If you haven't heard the phenomena slash company that is Webtoon, y'all are missing out. Like the amount of content and stories you can discover on that website slash app is astounding. There's so much to read and check out that it could take you literally months, dare I say years. Plus, if you know all about Tapas, Legend Comics, Legend Comics, however you pronounce that, and Pocket Comics, then you gotta know Webtoon. Their ads are nearly everywhere nowadays, as they should be. I'm of the opinion that comics and web comics are a valid form of storytelling and should be popularized more. I mean, it's where a lot of popular popular TV shows and movies are hailed from after all. Take Watchmen, Marvel Comics, DC Comics, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, Hellboy, Riverdale, etc. So for this video, I will be listing in no particular order five Webtoon original comics that are so underrated and need more roving eyes, love, and support. If you aren't aware, original comics on the Webtoon platform just means comics that the Webtoon company is actually paying artists to work on on a weekly basis and eventually finish. For those of you curious about the Canvas comics on Webtoon, I'll make another recommendation video just for them too. Now here are the rules for the original recommendations. They must have more than 10 episodes because you gotta let the new series that are coming out gain some sort of traction and have their time to shine before I can label them as underrated. Two, must have less than 500,000 subscribers. That's how you know they're underrated because most original series to be considered popular or successful enough in my eyes anyways have between maybe 500k to 900k subscribers. Those with more than 900 K are basically like the top dogs that get promoted every other week on the website. And third, must be an unfinished series. Honestly, this is to give the people currently working hard a chance to see more eyes and growth on their stories. Now with all that out of the way, on to the good stuff. So the first series that I am recommending is actually going to be Space Boy by Stephen McCraney. So basically this is a sci-fi drama starring main character Amy, who's lived a very happy life in a space colony until her family is actually transferred to Earth. There she tries to navigate life as the new girl until she meets the mysterious boy called Oliver. But Oliver isn't just any reclusive cutie. He's actually an advanced robot being controlled by the real human Oliver in space. Oliver is a survivor with a mission to make contact with a mysterious alien artifact floating in space and basically discover its secrets for the benefit of mankind. The organization funding this mission, however, has a dark secret that threatens Amy and Oliver's budding friendship and the town Amy has finally called home. So where do I even begin with Space Boy? Okay, so it's got sci-fi, so much cool sci-fi, hell. The geographical names of places and ethnicities on Earth are basically mashups of real places and ethnicities. And it's so fun to read every time I come across it. Like I know it's kind of like a weird thing to fixate and be so excited about, but I just, I don't know, I just like the mixture of like cultures and countries and so seeing McCraney actually like do this in his like futuristic sci-fi world is just it's such a sweet cherry on top. It's also got drama between not just Amy and Oliver but the organization keeping an eye on Oliver and Amy's new friends. It's also got romance, subtle romance I'll add. It's not the main focus but you can see it building slowly like it's being woven into Amy and Oliver's relationship and I love it. It's, oh my God, I would die for those two. Of course, if you think that's all that Space Boy has to offer, nay, nay. Space Boy even has like action scenes and a deeper underlying mystery with the organization and this guy. Who is he? What is he? What is even it? How is it involved in everything exactly? Cause this bee just appears everywhere and it's kind of getting like, it's itching, it's making my brain itch. Now we're moving to art style, and this is basically my commentary on the art style, and that it's basically, it's so unique and fun. Like if you look at the art for Space Boy, it's just the most, it's so beautiful. Like it's so comforting to look at and so easy to follow. Like it never feels cluttered or messy, but it has enough personal style that just looking at it makes you immediately know that our homeboy Stephen McCraney was here. And I gotta say, it's really refreshing to look at it compared to like some of the very 
every other like anime-ish looking series that are out there. Then you have the main characters, Amy and Oliver. Amy has this sweet, cheerful personality that's very honest and friendly, but don't get it twisted. Amy's got a backbone when it counts. As the main character, it's very easy for the audience to use her as a lens to see the world of Space Boy without actually losing her character traits in the process. In my opinion, Amy's very well written and the one I can say that the readers will have an easy time relating to. Then there's Oliver, who's a mystery from the first page. He's the perfect amount of intrigue and enigma and decent personality. In a lot of mystery characters, it can be so easy to make the character kind of disappointing and also kind of like an asshole. But Oliver is actually a very laid back, cool guy who's just like wicked talented in art. He really comes out of his shell in the series and you end up seeing a young man who's just gone through utter hell, but he is still holding on to life in such a passionate and admirable way. And the way he goes so far for Amy, oh, <laughs> my feelings. Hell, even the side characters are given purpose and drive and their own fun personalities that aren't two dimensional at all. And I cannot begin to tell you how much I appreciate that. It just makes the story feel so much more alive. If you're looking for a steady buildup of events that add in character introspection and really takes its time with its plot building to show you something amazing, then this is your series. Seriously guys, check out Space Boy. You will not regret it. There's even hard copies you can buy available. And I already have like the first two hard copies. I'm gonna get the rest of them once I get my finances in order. Now, the second comic that I'm recommending to you guys is Athena Complex by Kiaiser. Kiaiser. I'm so sorry if I said the name wrong. Kiaiser. So this story is a fantasy romance starring the main character, Athena. Greek goddess of war. That's right, y'all. This is a Greek mythology story. It's a very interesting modern interpretation. And I'm always a sucker for Greek mythology. So this caught my attention from the get go. Now, as I said, the main character is Athena, Greek goddess of war. She is totes in love with Poseidon. But when she gets rejected by him, she vows to get revenge. The time finally comes when punished for inciting a rebellion against Zeus, Poseidon is forced to reincarnate as a human. Athena pretends to be a human and befriend the newly reincarnated Poseidon before emotionally betraying him. But apparently, before she has a chance to do any of that, fate has other plans. So the genre for Athena Complex is fantasy, romance, and even Greek mythology. It even has badass action scenes that cater to the closet bloodlust in all of us. What's not to be hyped about the series? The romance takes its time to be built, and sometimes you can't even tell whether you want her to end up with Adrian, the reincarnated human, or Poseidon himself. Is there even a different aren't the two essentially the same? So many questions and too much Olympian intrigue happening behind the scenes. Will Athena carry out her revenge? Read to find out, cause I don't even know. The art style in Athena Complex lends true to its Korean anime-ish origins. It's a bit weak in certain panels, but for the most part, it's beautifully illustrated and really makes you overlook any flaws. Full of color and polish, the art does not hold you back at all. Even more fascinating, the artist went on a hiatus and recently came back. And basically, you can see how she reverts to the more polished classic anime inspired style that gives everything a more mature tone. And it's also really interesting to look at how the artist has improved from like the first episode to like the latest episode. It's, it's, it's so inspiring. So now we're gonna look at characters. Athena and Poseidon slash Adrian are the main characters in the series, obviously. Athena is considered wise, but she acts very childish in most of the scenes, giving her a not so intimidating impression compared to the world weary and mature Poseidon. I find this kind of interesting because as like the goddess of war and in some of like her mythology stories, she comes across as very like very much mature and serious and kind of not too fun fun. But this Athena honestly couldn't be further from the Greek stories. Now when it comes to Poseidon, his Adrian counterpart keeps to himself and has a more friendly and gentle side to him, which is a stark contrast to the actual Poseidon in the series. It does however make for an interesting dynamic and relationship between Athena and Adrian because in this case, Athena holds the emotional maturity and power. Between the three of them, it's interesting to see how they develop and the romance that is alluded between them. And I'm not even mentioning the other gods and goddesses that show up, like my beautiful sunshine boy and this screw up over here. I do look forward to seeing how Kaiser interprets the rest of the pantheon though. Now the pacing of this story is to the point, but steady and it gets to the important questions and sees without wasting any time. 
It doesn't rush either. Athena Complex knows when to take its time to get to know the characters and introduce their arcs as well. Rest assured, you will not be left bored or overwhelmed. So if you're looking for a unique modern Greek mythology story about a maybe love story between Athena and Poseidon with plenty of angst, action, and drama peppered in, this is your story. All right, my third recommendation is going to be Escape Room by Ten Park. Bruh, I can't believe more people aren't raving about this series. It's so gripping. It leaves me at the literal edge of my seat and even has the audacity to kick me off of it entirely. So basically, this story is a mystery thriller and it is about the main character, Sean. We're gonna go with Sean. I don't exactly know if it's Sheen, but Sean, who gets knocked out one night and wakes up in an odd room full of cryptic clues. Using logic and his unique sociopathic mind, Sean attempts to solve the clues only to be led to another room with even more clues and dangerous scenarios that not only threaten his life, but the life of the random people he finds trapped in this deadly escape room. Can Sean and his allies escape before the mystery of the escape room catches them for good? Who knows? From first glance, you could tell this is a thriller and then come to find out it's actually an escape room scenario that the main character has to solve in order to escape. Hell yes. I'm sold. And if the thriller wasn't enough, there's actually a bigger mystery about how Sean and the other people he encounters actually came to be in this escape room and why. It's like Saw meets the Korean manhwa genre. It definitely has horror elements that makes you blink twice and really open your eyes to make sure you're looking at what you think you're looking at. If you're a fan of some gore and implied violence, you will get plenty of panels to satisfy your bloodlust here. I even hazard to say there's like a 5% chance of romance, if we can call it that. But only because Sean finds Heather and the two try surviving together and I don't know the vibes I get from Sean just seem like if the two make it out alive maybe something could bloom that's if Heather doesn't die first it's not the main focus of the plot and Sean is more invested in getting anyone he can to survive this thing so for now camaraderie and survival is the real name of the game but you know hopeful me now the art style is very simple in this webcomic but it is effective in communicating the story and bringing out the appropriate emotions the true hero is the complex backgrounds and 3d assets that really help bring bring this story to life. It sets the tone and setting for the violence and Sean's bleak situation. If anything, I think the simplicity of Ten Park's character art and the complexity of the backgrounds is a perfect pairing because your focus will be drawn to the real main characters of the series, aka the clues and puzzles that Sean has to solve. Now to the characters, Sean is considered so overly rational. He's nearly a sociopath. It's not outright called that he is, but it's very much heavily implied, especially in the webtoon summary. Normally, this type of behavior brings isolation and a sense of being a misfit because a lot of people can't relate or get freaked out by his insensitivity. However, throw him in a deadly escape that requires you to think, be rational, and use your common sense, and you have like the perfect protagonist for a thriller. Other characters get introduced, but none is more involved than Heather, as I mentioned previously, who is a seemingly normal and overly emotional girl stuck in a nightmare. She's not as smart as Sean, but she does have her moments where she shines. However, briefly, Sean seems invested in her survival, as long as it doesn't get him killed, but there's a mystery behind why Heather is in the escape room, and it's one that I think threatens to reveal her character to be a maybe not so innocent one. Lastly, we have pacing. As predicted from a thriller, the pacing of the story is fast. Thankfully, it's not too fast where it leaves you confused. It starts out telling enough about Sean to understand he's going to be thrown into an environment where he just might survive. The scenes during each escape room takes its time to illuminate the clues and Sean figuring out how to work each clue. Each episode always hangs with a cliffhanger that makes you keep reading past the wee hours of the night, but leaves you with plenty of information to digest and foreshadowing to keep track of. So if you're into a survival type, deadly escape room mystery story with a Sherlock type protagonist minus the arrogance, Escape Room has you covered. It's already completed season one and started posting episodes for season two, so you can literally binge that good shish to your heart's content. Recommendation numero four is going to be Lavender Jack by Dan Shikade. This historical superhero story is about a mysterious figure known as Lavender Jack who prowls the city of Gallery and is exposing the corruption of the city's most prominent rich nobles? Can anyone bring down this dashing rogue with quick wit or will his strange powers of bursting guns and lamps into mini explosions make him an uncatchable mystery? Enter Madame Ferrier. I hope I'm saying that right. A highly appraised detective who has solved every case she's encountered. Hired to figure out Lavender Jack's identity and bring him to justice. Will she expose who this rogue is or will a more sinister threat lurking in the wilds of gentle society force Madame Ferrier and Lavender Jack to work together to take down this murderous foe. Doesn't that sound like a ball? <laughs> 
<laughs> so the genres for this story is basically like reading a historian Victorian novel. Not only can you see the visuals, but it has a lot of superhero influence, strange adventures, and rapier sharp wit. The comedy is also not lost in this story at all. It really makes it enjoyable to read. But comedy isn't the only selling point going on. The mystery of the corruption of the nobles is prominent and it leads to the mystery of the characters of the story as well. I dare even say romance is evolved because Madame Ferrier's love to her wife is tear jerking as well as Lavender Jack's angsty love life. It's also very LGBTQ plus friendly with Madame Ferrier being a non-arrogant and humble lesbian Sherlock and a slew of other characters who don't make it a secret that the world is more than just black and white. All right, now I gotta say Lavender Jack's art style is very reminiscent of old school American comic books with its simple but cohesive color palette and minor details that really brings everything together in such a spectacular way. Nothing is impossible with this dynamically humble art style that becomes basically a signature for Dan Shikade. In fact, his story and art was even nominated for the Eisner and Ringo comic book awards. Talk about having a chuffed portfolio. Now onto the characters. Madame Ferrier is, as I previously mentioned, basically a non-arrogant, self-aware lesbian Sherlock. She is such a badass in such a humble way, it's like really refreshing to read. She not only has a tough side to her, but also a very loving one. This is prominently seen when interacting with her wife. There are other characters that make a prominent appearance. Chief Inspector Honoria Crabbe, who is very much by the books and determined to get to the bottom of not just Lavender Jack, but corruption in gallery. Then there's the stoic but crafty Ducky, my personal favorite homegirl, and Sir Mimley's mate. She's a lot more intelligent than she lets on though, so don't let her fool you. Then we have cavalier, charismatic, and witty Sir Mimley himself. And we also have the mysterious and strong and impeccably dressed Lavender Jack, who also appears, as well as the enigmatic, quite possibly bad news Lady Hawthorne. Literally, you will never be bored with any of the characters that are getting introduced because it's all just so much fun to read. Now, I have to see that the pacing of this story is also pretty well done. It tells you the information in such a natural way without info dumping or bogging down the episodes to such a slow pace. It's naturally steady and reads like a novel almost with how the transition happens. You're never stuck on one character or a piece of plot information for too long, so there's always something new and important to learn in each update. So if you're interested in a Scarlet Pimpernel meets Sherlock meets old school American comic book art style, then Lavender Jack is the hero for you. Seasons one and two are complete with season three current in the works. Check it out. You won't be let down. And finally, we come to the fifth recommendation, Shadow Prophet by Marissa Del Brassine. I hope I'm saying that right. And Anne Del Sate. I also hope I'm saying that right. So this is a sci-fi drama that stars the main character, Ishto. I really hope I'm saying that right. Living life as a student with her successful government employed boyfriend, Ryuchi, in a totalitarian society where prophet god Godu reigns supreme. But then things take a turn for the worst when she's exiled down and suddenly involved in a political terrorist group that shakes her long-held beliefs in society. Will Ishto find out what the hell is going on in her world and why this is happening to her before it's too late? I hope so, man. So right off the bat, I want to say this story has strong 1984 Ray Bradbury vibes. So it's heavy on the science fiction in that sense. Then add in the drama of Ishto and her boyfriend, the childhood friend who shows up, the exile and the meeting of eccentric characters, and just getting a general glimpse of what the flip Ryuchi is up to on the other side of society and you basically have a recipe for major trauma and we're not even going to talk about this witch yet. I can also add with confidence there's romance in the series if Ryuchi and Ishto hadn't already made it obvious. There's even a love triangle maybe because the childhood friend comes back and apparently has feelings for Ishto still despite living and maybe being in a relationship with this individual. I'm not sure where Ishto is going to land on between these two, maybe none, but it's interesting to see Ryuchi and Icho's genuine feelings for Ishto, despite the morbid hopelessness the society they live in inspires. Add in a couple of suspenseful scenes and an overarching mystery, and you have one deliciously enticing series at your disposal. Art style wise, I have to say that the Shadow Prophet has an even more unique art style than Space Boy. It's definitely not dull in any way, and I even dare want to say that the squarish stylization makes it even more appropriate for the Pipper Crane slash origami motif that is really prominent in the series. Like it all just fits together and isn't messy in any way. The art style is easy to understand and the color palette just adds depth to the scene in a way that's actually very breathtaking. I highly recommend you observe just how the panels are laid out and how even the story bubbles are so interesting and beautifully made because I'm telling y'all there was a lot of love and thought poured into the series. Now we have our characters. 
Ishto is the main character, obviously. She is a very diligent and quirky good girl who wants to help make the society she lives in a better place. You can tell she suffers through bouts of uncertainty and self-deprecation, which makes her a ripe target for the rebel group that Ijo is a part of when she gets exiled. It's interesting to see how she deals with crisis situations without leaning into one side too much. Her love for Ryuchi aside, of course. Still, she has a really good head on her shoulders and I stand self-awareness. Then we have Ryuchi Soko, her boyfriend, or I guess ex in this case, who is another important character in the series. Now he interests me because of how complicated his character is. He comes across very cold and standoffish, but then he shows you moments of actually caring for Ishito and her well-being. But it's also contrasted by his actions that cause Ishito to be exiled in the first place. And then you're left wondering, who is Ryuchi really? What's his deal? What's his game plan here? Because it feels like he's masterminding something and it may or may not be something evil. His mystery is just one that makes my head itch so bad and I'm so desperate to know what the hell is gonna happen next. Next we have the pacing. The pacing for the story is steady and gradual as it builds up the world building and the connections of Ishito Ryuji and the society they live in. It definitely gets where it needs to go so it never really wastes any time with unnecessary texts or scenes. It's not a super fast pace but I say it's a read that's just right. Don't underestimate Shadow Prophet because before you know it you're gonna be hooked. So if you guys are looking for any totalitarian sci-fi dramas with smatterings of romance and heavy helpings of mystery, conspiracies, and paper crane motifs, and a distinctive non-boring art style, then Shadow Prophet has you covered. Check it out, y'all. And at last, we've made it to the end of the video. Any questions, comments, or comic recommendations from other Webtoon apps, whether it's Webtoon or Tapas or etc., leave them down below. I will be eager to see what you guys actually leave behind. Who knows, maybe I'll even make another video in the future about your recommendations. Appropriate links for these comics and then some will be available in the description box below. Thanks for watching. Go ahead and like and subscribe if you're feeling my content. I'll catch you all in the next video. Until next time, cheers.